So having bootstrapped in this fashion here, this was an example of one bootstrap sample. It gave us an answer of 1.65 for a bootstrap value. We tried that 1,000 times. We got an answer of 0.42 for the standard error. Recall the, the, the usual answer was 0.41 based on Fisher information. So we haven't got an answer very different from the usual answer. But there is something else we can get. I just asked the question here, can the bootstrap provide other information besides an estimate of standard error? We've had hints of that already. Well, the answer is yes, and we can find out by drawing a histogram of the bootstrap values. So having done this a thousand times, we get a thousand bootstrap values of beta hat, and we simply plot a histogram of them. Well, this, the results are kind of interesting. Here's a histogram of the thousand bootstrap values. Remember, the original estimate was 1.51, so it's it's the bootstrap distribution is centered around 1.51. The reason I mention that is, if you look in the tech report under bias, well, what would have happened if this, this uh, histogram was centered about one, say? You'd think there's probably something wrong with the estimator, right? There's, our original estimate was 1.5, but the bootstrap values say we're centered around one. That might be evidence that the est original estimator, beta hat, is biased. And indeed, you can formalize that and, and estimate the bias of beta hat through the bootstrap. We won't talk about that today, but there are details in the tech report. It looks like here we're okay. The histogram is centered at about 1.5, but it's skewed to the right. Estimators are supposed to be normal, but for small samples, of course, they're not always normal. In this case, it's skewed to the right, and if we were to form a confidence interval for beta based on this information, that confidence interval may be asymmetric about 1.51. I'm not going to go into details there. Again, that'll be the last section if we get to it. But the information in the shape of this histogram can be very useful in forming a confidence interval for beta. Yes, at the back. Sorry, can you stand up? I can't hear you. Could you talk a little louder? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. That's thank you very much. <laughs> You're way ahead of me. I almost forgot this slide. All right. I was. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Intuitively, suppose we wanted a confidence interval for beta. I'm going to just give you a, a quick rule of thumb here, maybe to, to, to whet your appetite for reading on about confidence intervals. Suppose we, we wanted a confidence interval. Well, here's an intuitive idea. Suppose we wanted a 95% confidence interval. Why not just take the histogram and find the points such that 5% of the areas, excuse me, let's go for a 90% confidence interval, which this actually is. Um, suppose we find the number such that there's 5% in this tail and 5% in this tail. They happen to turn out to be 0.93 and 2.34. That seems like a, a reasonable way to define a confidence interval for beta. And as I mentioned earlier, if that contains 0, you might say, well, there's, there's, evidence that, there's not evidence that beta is the, of a treatment effect. Here, there certainly is evidence of a treatment effect. But this is not the final answer about confidence intervals. If you read about uh, confidence intervals and also this paper that's mentioned in JASA, there's, there's a longer story there. This isn't always a valid interval. But it's often a good guess. It's about the best you can say. OK, the question was, if, if we were to call 0.93, 2.34 a confidence interval for beta, what would be the interpretation? 
Well, the interpretation that is aimed at is exactly the same as in a frequent sense. That that interval contains, under repeated sampling, that interval will contain the true beta with, say, 90% probability. Now, I haven't justified why this should be such an interval, and that's a longer story. Yes, the aim is to get a classical interval. The question was, what's the difference between the sampling distribution of theta hat star and the sampling distribution of theta hat? Well, the only difference is, is that f is replaced by f hat. I mean, the sampling distribution of theta hat depends on the unknown f. And all we've done with the bootstrap is simply replace f by f hat. OK, the, the rest of the question was, in terms of the difference between f and f hat, can you say anything in general about the difference between this histogram and what you get if you knew f? Is that, is that the question? Right. OK. Yes? Uh, if it doesn't look that way, it's because of my bad artistry. Um, that's what I meant anyway. <laughs> okay. Yes? Okay, the question was, suppose you knew something about the distribution of beta hat. Um, could you incorporate that into bootstrap sampling? Yes, the answer is yes, you can. Um, for example, suppose you, you knew, suppose you're estimating location and you, knew, you believed your population was symmetric. There's an example. If you did naive, naive bootstrap sampling, you'd replace f by the empirical distribution f hat. Now, f hat isn't necessarily symmetric, right, for a given sample. And then you could bootstrap from that. Well. To incorporate the information that the true f is symmetric, you could use a symmetric estimate. For instance, you could take f hat and add to it the ver the, a reflected version of f hat, and hence get a symmetric estimate, and bootstrap from that. So essentially, th to answer your question in general, any prior information about f could be incorporated into the bootstrap program by, by using an estimator f hat that reflects that information. If f is symmetric, make f hat symmetric. If, f is, if you know f is normal, use a normal f hat. Of course, that's a rare situation, but that's Fisher's point of view. But of course, Fisher didn't have a computer to work with, so he, as Brad mentioned, was, was limited by hand calculators. He didn't want to put a, get a barrel of, a barrel, throw in a million slips of paper and sample from it, right? That would have been a lot of work. Any more questions about this example or bootstrap sampling in general? Yes. Yes. Okay, the question was. Uh, the question su suggested another, another way of finding confidence intervals, namely take the middle, 1.51, and add, say, plus or minus twice the standard error, which in this case was not up there, but it was, what, 0.42. That's another way of, of forming a confidence interval, very close to the classical way. That is not quite as good. And one way to see that is that that interval is, is symmetric, by definition, about its middle. Whereas a good confidence interval for small samples may, may be longer to one tail than the other. For instance, this is farther away from 1.5 on the right than it is on the left. So this, is, this kind of interval can start to pick up asymmetry in the, in the confidence interval. As I mentioned, we've just seen a hint of the fact that we may not always just be interested in standard error, but some other 
other function of the bootstrap distribution. And we'll see that more in the afternoon in a formal sense. Moving on to the second example, it concerns projection pursuit regression. And it's a case of a classical technique that has been uh, generalized with the power of the computer. So let me first describe what this technique is, and then we'll see how to apply the bootstrap to it. The, the data we have is the familiar regression data. We'll have a response we'll call Y and a set of covariates, X1 through XP. Now I have to apologize, the slides are in a little different order than your notes, so I guess this will be a good way to keep you awake. We'll, I'll be jumping around. Just for this example, the slides are not in the same order as appears in your, your copy of them. Move that down a little bit. So our, our actual data will consist of n realizations of those p-tuples, denoted by y1, x11 through x1p, through to yn, xn1 to xnp. The familiar uh, regression model, the linear regression model, of course, says that the expected value of y is alpha plus, say, the summation from 1 to p of beta i xij. Now, this thing called projection pursuit regression, its model is more general. It's stated as follows. It says the mean of y is now a sum of smooth functions of projections of the data. That's in one sentence. Let me explain more what, what this is. First of all, x sub i rep represent the observations for the ith individual, ith observation. This aj is a unit vector. And this sj is some smooth function. Now, it's going to be an unspecified function. We're not going to say it's linear or quadratic. We're going to, we're going to leave it unspecified. We're going to estimate it in a non-parametric fashion. So comparing these two models, we see that this model is more general than this one because it allows not just linear functions, but smooth functions of linear functions. The things we have to estimate are the unit vector A and the whole function S. Oh, by the way, I should say that um, in the tech, if you're interested in references to these things, they're all mentioned in the tech report. I haven't included them here because it would just clutter up the slides, but so projection pursuit regression, for instance, was well invented by Tukey and Friedman, I guess, in 64. They came up with the, in 74, the idea of projection pursuit. And then using it in regression was, was suggested by Friedman and Stutzley in an 81 JASA paper. So here again is this projection pursuit model. And I've stated that in some way this, this generalizes the, the usual regression model. To see that, well, if m was 1, so we take only one term in the summation, and we force s to be linear, we're simply going to get expected value of y as a linear function of aj dot x. And I should say this, is, this means dot product. So this is just summation aij xi. So with, with S linear, we simply get the familiar model back again, right? We take one term and make S linear, we're back to the usual model. So in other words, this model is more general. Let me leave the model up here. I know when, when I first saw this model, I thought it was a little bit strange. So I'll leave it up on that other projector. This new model generalizes that the linear model in two ways. It allows nonlinear functions and also sums of them. So I'll just leave this model for your convenience up here. So that's the model we're going to apply to a set of data. Are there questions about the model? If there are, maybe they'll become clear when I show how one estimates it. The basic tool in estimating this model, in estimating the S's, namely, is a so-called scatterplot smoother. 
And here I'll do a little bit of motion graphics to try to explain that. Suppose we have just y versus x. And here's our data, the red dots. Move that up a little bit. And we, we, we want to estimate the dependence of y on x in some non-parametric way. We're not gonna just going to fit a line. We're going to try to estimate a curve through there. Here's how a scatter plot smoother works. It says, well, suppose we want to estimate the smooth at a point x0. Let's take a window of points around x0, a set of neighbors. And within that window, we will average. See, do I have that slide? OK. Within this window, we'll just average the y values. Say you just take their mean. That's the simplest way. More complicated, you could take fit a, actually a line within the window or some other function. But let's just think of a running mean. So within this window, we'll take a mean. And I've represented by the, the green point. The result is if we take the mean of all these y, all the points in this window, take the mean of their y values, we get this value here. Represent it with a green dot. Now we do that, we sweep across the data set, taking the mean in each window. The result is a smooth estimate of the dependence of y on x. Well, the question was, would it have discontinuities? Um, well, actually, I've taken a little bit of poetic license here. The, the, we don't actually only get an estimate of x of the smooth a, at the data points. I've just sort of joined them in a smooth way. But the point here is that if we fit a line to this data, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't really represent the trend of y on x. There's clearly some nonlinear dependence going on there, and this, this running mean has picked it up. Yes? Isn't that simply a moving average? Moving average, another word for it, yeah. OK, so that's going to be our basic tool in estimating this projection pursuit model. Let me ask if there are any questions about that, because this scatter plot smooth is going to re recur in other examples. Yes? Oh, the second point, you've caught me there. Th that was just a, I had something else in mind, but let's. I think it was just a way of trying to line up the transparencies. <laughs> Let's forget about that black dot. Yes? OK, the questions were, the first one was <coughs> uh, concerning the fact that if, you want, if I did a bootstrap sampling and got a standard error and you wanted to check it, you would need my whole sample. That's true, whereas with normal distributions, you'd say just need the mean and the variance that I estimated. But that's not a real disadvantage. The second question, um, Did you, did you state the second question again? I didn't. Right. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I remember now. You, right, the question, let me see if I get this right. 
was that if I was bootstrapping in a complicated situation, then the algorithm would be complicated. And I couldn't just say the algorithm I gave you at the beginning of the session would, wouldn't tell the whole story. That's true, but again, there's, sort of, there's two separable pieces. There's the, the subroutine that, that estimates the statistic, that computes the statistic, and there's the main line that computes the bootstrap sampling. As, a, as the statistic becomes more complicated, only the first thing changes. Only the theta, the subroutine that computes theta hat changes. The bootstrap sampling is the same. OK. Well, he can, I, he can describe much in the way we're describing what I'm not sure I understand your question. How, how actually you computed the, the estimate you got, or? OK, the question was, uh, because I think it's the question is, because the bootstrap is so powerful, one could simply say, bootstrap a complicated problem, report the answer, and not explain how one did it. Well, I th certainly, the onus is on the researcher or the statistician to explain carefully how he bootstrapped. I mean, all I can say is one has to carefully explain what, exactly how you set the problem up, how you resampled, and how you got the answer. Maybe we can talk about that more if that doesn't answer your question. Yes? That, that, that's, the question was, is this x actually the projected data, like a dot x? That's what's going to be, right? This is just going to be our, our uh, building block, and then we're going to smooth on, on directions. So that's a running mean. That's going to be the building block for our projection pursuit algorithm. Again, I'm still describing the, the black box here. I haven't even got to the bootstrap part. Here's the black box. Our, our objective is to estimate the terms in this model, namely the functions s, s1 through sm, and the vectors a1 through am. Here's how one does it. We do it in a forward stepwise fashion. First of all, so forward stepwise, we're going to estimate a1 and s1 first. Suppose we fix the direction a1. Then what one does to estimate s1 is simply smooth y on a1 dot x. For example, compute a running mean of y on the projection of x in this direction a1. So if we know a1, we can get s1. Of course, we don't know a1. So the second step is to search over all directions, a1, to minimize a residual sum of squares. So this requires a quite sophisticated computer program. It's a, doing a numerical search over all unit vectors. For each unit vector a1, we have to smooth y on a1 dot x. For each pair of a1 and s1, we get a residual sum of squares. 
and we repeat the whole process until we find that the, the minimum, I should put a hat on the A1, we find the A1 hat and the S1 hat that minimize the residual sum of squares. That's called the projection pursuit regression algorithm. And that's, you can see where the name comes from now. We're pursuing direct projections that give us small sum of squares. Again, a complicated black box, but if you like, just think of it as a black box, this top half. I've, I've skipped ahead now to page 22, prime. We have a set of regression data. We've applied this complicated black box. And oh, by the way, I've decided to take m equals 2. So I'm just going to take two directions and two functions. This black box produces a f an S1 hat, an A1 hat, an S2 hat, and an A2 hat. And this, as we saw, it's a very sophisticated black box. OK, this slide will go up again. We're going to apply this to a set of real data and then apply the bootstrap. I will leave this again over here. This is a set of data given to us by Leo Bryman of Berkeley, consisting of 330 observations, the response being ozone concentration, the covariates, five covariates, Sandberg Air Force Base temperature, inversion base height, Daggett pressure gradient, visibility, and day of year. So essentially, we had, we had uh, this data set consists of the measurements on 330 days of ozone in these five covariates. We'd like to see which of these five covariates is most responsible, say, for high or low ozone concentration. We fit this two-term PPR model, again, using a complicated computer program. The results were the following, not very legible. I've just shown you the two directions that came out. Remember, these are unit vectors, so we can, we can look at the various contributions here, oh, and also that the variables were standardized. So we can look at the contributions here and see the large numbers correspond to large effects, and some of these small numbers correspond to small effects. The first direction, you can see, is fairly evenly spread over the five variables. The second direction consists mostly of, the, of day of year. So again, we've just applied this black box to the ozone data. We've got out A1 hat, S A2 hat, S1 hat, and S2 hat. I haven't drawn you the two functions. If we were analyzing this data in a thorough fashion, we'd also look, of course, at the two functions. But for the purposes of uh, example today, we're just going to look at the directions and try to estimate the variability using the bootstrap. Yes? How do we choose n? Oh, excuse me, M. Uh, it's actually done in somewhat of a heuristic way using F tests. Just like you do in regression, you see a forward stepwise regression. You look at how much the next term reduces the residual sum of squares. Same way here, except the, the theory is not as well developed. But I've sort of ignored that, and I've just taken M to be 2. Yes? Well, there are similarities. Principal component analysis uh, is not, not usually applied to regression data. I mean, it's usually you have a, say, just a set of covariate, a set of variables like x1 through x5, and you want to find the direction, say, that maximizes the, the variance along that direction. Here we have a response. So uh, this is an asymmetric problem, unlike principal components. But as well, that there's an additional component, namely the smooth function. Right? We're finding this direction to minimize a sum of squares, but it also involves that smooth function. Whereas the principal components, you're essentially taking the data, projecting them in a linear fashion, and seeing which projection minimizes, maximizes the variance along that direction. Here, our criterion's a little more complicated, right? We're looking at variance, but 
with, a, with these smooth functions also thrown in. So it's, it's related. But because it's more complicated, you can't just write down the answer like you can in principal components. You can't just write down the eigenvalues of the of certain matrix and come up with an answer. But it's, it's closely related. Well, ha having applied the black box, this black box, gotten two directions and two functions, of course, we'd like to know well, how much variability is there in the process. Now, if you think about it for a minute, or a few seconds, right, it's, it's a pretty hard problem to analyze with pencil and paper. This algorithm is very complicated, and it'd be, I'd say, impossible even to get an approximate formula for, say, the standard error of one of the A's. But the bootstrap doesn't, doesn't mind complicated black boxes. It just, by brute force, puts in bootstrap data, applies the black box, and gets out bootstrap values. In detail, here's how one bootstraps projection pursuit regression, or one way to do it. Sample with replacement from the six tuples. In other words, the sampling unit is y1, x11 through x15, that's one sample, sampling unit, through, through, through to x, uh, y330 and its covariates. So we sample each of the six tuples as a unit. For instance, a, a typical bootstrap sample looks like y1 star, x11 star through x15 star through to y330, y star 330, x330 star 1, etc. So again, a point I want to stress is that the x's go along with its y. The units are kept together as we sample. So one samples with replacement from those, number, from those six tuples. Having done that, we apply the black box. And I'll put that up on the, so the video can see. We apply the black box. Namely, we apply the entire bootstrap algorithm to that data set, giving us a direction and a smooth, another direction and another smooth. So one application of the black box would give us one bootstrap replication. And that whole process is then done, say, 100 or 1,000 times. And our objective was to somehow get a, a, an estimate of the variability of the directions. How much trust can we put in those original directions? Well, let, me, let me put up the original directions. Put them over here. Remember, the first one was fairly evenly spread over the five variables. The second one was, has most of its weight on, the, on day of year. So how much variability is in these directions? That's the question. The results are displayed on this slide. I think I did this a thousand times, which of course required a big computer. Okay, the top half of the slide shows the results for the first direction. Okay, running up from the bottom to the top is A11, A12, A13, A14, A15. So this is a histogram of the thousand values of A11, namely the first element of the first direction. Now the, the histogram is in, in black on this slide, and in green is the same thing if, if I did things in a, the usual linear way. In other words, if I just did a usual regression and wrote down the coefficients. Actually, I had to standardize the coefficients because to make the comparison valid. See, if we want to know how variable things are, we have to have something to compare it to. So I compared it to the usual, the usual estimates. And you can see that they're, well, oh, the little ticks here are the original direction, namely these numbers here, 0.20 through minus 0.14. Things don't look too bad. 
in each case, they're only a little more variable than the regression one coefficients. And as we mentioned, you could find a confidence interval for each of these directions by perhaps cutting off 5% on each tail of those histograms. Yes? In the handout, A11 is 0.8. Whoops, yeah. Thank you. That was, this number was smudged, and I. Thank you. The first component of the first direction should be 0 0.80. Yeah. Sure enough, yeah, it's, sure enough, it's about around 0 0.80. So the first direction is quite stable. Now look what happened to the second direction. Things are all over the place. Most amazing is this, this top one here. Well, that was for day of year. It was minus 0.98. But the bootstrap replicates are all over the place. There's a lot of variability in this process. Not surprisingly, the more things you estimate, right, the more variability you get in the estimates. This is a complicated model consisting of two functions and two directions. And we're paying the price. There's a lot of variability in this, this model, in these directions. As a result, um, it would certainly be unwise to, inter to put a lot of interpretation on the, say, this 0.98 for minus 0.98 for day of year. Because the bootstrap replicates are range from minus 1 all the way to maybe 0.3. I hear, but I don't see it. There we go. Okay. Yes. OK, the first question was, how do you tell the first direction from the second direction? I, I didn't say. We're doing things in a forward stepwise way. So the first direction is the one that produces the smallest residual sum of squares. The second direction then comes next. OK, then this, the other question was concerning the smooths. What I haven't shown you is every time we do a bootstrap replicate, we get not only directions, but also smooths. And there's another half to the problem. We could look at the variability of the smooth functions. And actually, an example I'm not going to get to, but it's, if you're interested, you can read on in the, in the notes. There's an example that looks at variability of smooth functions. And you can plot them and see how much variability they have as they go along, as you move along the x abscissa. Yes? I be, I'm sorry. The covariable, that's true. Well, the, the, yes, the, co the comment was that there's also at information on the covariability of the A's. Indeed, uh, the covariability is probably very high because there's so much. If, if the original X's are correlated, it's going to induce correlation in these estimates. So that, that may be what we're seeing here largely is correlation in the original covariates. Yes? Right. Does that mean that your original estimate is highly biased? Uh, not really, because these things are standardized between minus 1 and 1. So. Uh, it seems awfully suspicious that all your bootstrap estimates, or most of them, are to one side of your original estimate. But rem well, remember, they're standardized between, to, to be between minus 1 and 1. So once I get point, having got point, minus 0 0.98 originally, I can't get anything less than minus 1. So this, is, this ha problem has a little complication there. What I'm saying is, in that search for, unit, for vectors, we restrict them to be unit vectors, right? So if, if a unit vector can't have any component bigger than an absolute value than 1. That's right. We know very little about the second direction. but. Suppose if one was only interested, say, in predicting the response, it may be that there's not that much vari variability in the actual response surface. It may be that what we're seeing here is that because of high correlations, as was mentioned, the same response surface can be represented in many different ways. 
So what we're pointing out here is that, as I mentioned on the next slide, it's one does not want to put too much weight on the actual coefficients. Yes? It's non-significant. I didn't say that. Well, uh, yeah. No, but that's yeah, the question was: Can we say based on this picture that the second direction is non-significant? Uh, not at all. I think the, the, first of all, the way to answer the question would be to look at how much the residual sum of squares decreased having added the second direction. But based on this picture, it, it could go either way. It may be that because of high correlation, as I mentioned, the same, um, many different directions pick up the same effect. But that may be a large effect. You, you see what I, suppose, suppose two of the, co the variables were very highly correlated, and that's going to, that's going to cause each of them to have very large variance. But perhaps either one has got a large effect. So it's not enough to just to look at this picture. Yes? The question was, would it be effective to look at a, to do a principal component analysis of the direction? That's a very interesting suggestion. Actually, I think that would be useful because you can then see where the variability lies. Right. That's a very good suggestion, yeah, and that relates, yeah, again, to picking up the correlations. I think, again, shows that uh, certainly it's not clear how to, how to uh, analyze bootstrap results. I mean, you've almost got a new problem in data analysis again, right? We do all this bootstrapping, we get data out. Now, how do we assess what we see? I mean, how do we summarize it? Well, it's not quite yeah. automatic. I beg your pardon? It's not, quite automatic. not quite automatic. The procedure's automatic, but the interpretation still requires some cleverness, yeah. Well, be careful. The autocorrelations in the x's, I mean, all, all the uh, a regression model assumes is that given x, you've got independent errors. Yeah, but yeah. you need an autocorrelation. You don't have to do it. Oh, OK. Yes. OK. Um, I'll finish up right now. Yeah, to answer your question, I guess I'll sort of put it off till this afternoon when we look at autocorrelated errors. Okay, let's take a break for lunch and we'll resume at 1.15.